Since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that defenses for peace must be constructed. Is the Cold War back again? Many observers think so, but others disagree. In this film, we will talk with several experts in order to analyze the current tensions between Russia and the West. Even if there is no real ideological struggle being waged, nationalist feelings are strong on all sides. Both superpowers and others have nuclear weapons, so the risk of a catastrophic confrontation is always there. We will ask, what are the roots of the crisis? What are the prospects for a peaceful outcome? What should our governments be doing? And where can civil society make a difference? It was a bipolar geopolitical confrontation between two blocks in which the major powers of each of those held overwhelming uh, superiority in sort of nuclear, military, and other terms, and had a very tight alliance system confronting each other ideologically. At the time, the Cold War, if you have to understand it historically, uh, one of the key elements of the Cold War was the ideological contradiction between capitalism and socialism um, that was then crystallized in the competition or conflict confrontation between the United States and the Soviet Union and their allies. So are we in a Cold War situation? The major challenge uh, we are facing is not only Ukraine but, uh, but uh, the whole international community is the violation all the international law by the permanent member of uh, the United Nations Security Council. That's a major challenge. And uh, all, uh, there are other challenges uh, as well. First of all, it's uh, uh, tremendous humanitarian challenges. The uh, migration uh, crisis, the violent extremism, terrorism, and, and so on. So what are the root causes of this crisis? What is happening? It started really in the context of the Arab Spring, where you had lots of demands for more democracy against these uh, authoritarian regimes, uh, which was in a way the end of the Cold War in the Middle East. Uh, as I said, the Cold War was a sort of uh, uh, a worldwide uh, a freezing of international relations and, and and general acceptance of some measure of authoritarianism for the sake of stability. Balkanization seems to be the best term to, th to think about these conflicts uh, applies to Syria in the sense that I would say that now observers talk about Syria not as being uh, a civil war anymore but as being a war with a proxy wars but not just between NATO and Russia but between many different actors. So what I think is that we are living in a period where the world will be new divided between the new and the old powers. And the new uprising powers want to have a big, bigger part of the cake. Resources, trade, ways, profit. And the old powers, mainly the United States, want to defend what they have and even get also a little bit more. And this creates a lot of problems. And one part of the problems are the relations between the Western countries and Russia. This has political implications, but a lot of economic implications. And one of the main economic implications is the new trade world system. And this TTIP, the relations, the new trade system between the United States and Europe, is also one issue to enlarge the power of the Western countries and to reduce the influence of China and above all Russia. So, I think you can speak about confrontation. It has economic, political and social implications and it is above all very dangerous between both sides of nuclear weapons. We are in a very different era compared to the Cold War. And the term balkanization meant to refer to the fact that conflicts now are increasingly uh, thought in terms of localism, uh, the importance of ethnic and racial uh, divides, 
religious divide as well uh, that seems to structure uh, uh, both international relations and uh, national policies and politics. Although it's clear that the perspective from Moscow is about a geopolitical struggle where they're being surrounded and pressed on all sides, and that's, I think, a source of tension, but it's not really anything resembling the kind of situation we had in the 1970s and 80s in that respect. So it's, let's call it normal geopolitical competition. The current situation between the West and Russia is very disturbing. It, it does smell of a Cold War situation, and even though there is no ideological confrontation, it seems to be a confrontation of power, a confrontation over resources. So that is my main concern here, that there is um, not only words of confrontation, but also practical forms of confrontations. Uh, with military build-ups on both sides. The Nordic countries that were kind of models for social development seem to be going into a more militarized situation. And of course Norway having a, Russia, a border with, uh, with Russia, if now also uh, Sweden and Finland becomes NATO members, it, it it will be seen from Russia as provocative. So in terms of, if you think about the Cold War as East versus West, in the old sense of Russia versus the United States in the sort of very focalized way, um, that I don't think that, that really exists. We do have tensions, there's no question about that. Mm -hmm. But they're not the sort of, there's no universal uh, idea behind those tensions. The Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, CIPRI, has cooperated with IPP over the last year on the Global Day of Action on Military Spending, where IPP is basing its campaign on the data that uh, CIPRI is annually developing. And these data show that we are spending around 1.7 trillion dollars a year for military purposes. That equals more than 600 years of the UN budget. So what should be done for peaceful prospects? I think that we need to pay a lot more attention to, you know, really serious post-conflict peace building kind of uh, engagements and not just say, well, this is the UN and the UNDP, but security first. Um, and I don't mean that in the sense of hard military security, but if you can't provide basic conditions of security for individuals, then you don't have the basis for economic development, for, for human development, for human security. Um, you have to kind of start at that level. During this crisis, what can the civil society do? Hopefully, with, with um, uh, civil society and also women's organizations, peace organizations, being actively involved in how to implement this new development agenda, uh, we might move towards this equality, development, peace, holistic approach. I think that uh, it's a manifestation of the fact that uh, civil society and non-nuclear weapon state actors have understood that if they are not doing something, the nuclear weapon states are not going to enforce Article 6 of the NPT, which mandates that they engage in good faith in nuclear disarmament measures. The involvement of uh, civil society, in a sense, is by essence uh, what nuclear weapons administration have tried to block. So civil society here, again, has a very important role to play to ask that international relations be conducted in a transparent way rather than in this opaque way. After watching these different explanations and opinions, we understand that, although there isn't an ideological opposition, not only do we have international tensions, but also, emerging from them, nuclear threats. This is why, 
It is essential to keep encouraging our civil societies and for them to keep getting involved and organized on the matter so that we can all move forward towards a peaceful and sustainable world.